So I'd like to bring to the stage Professor Sarah Harper for her talk, Human Longevity, Myths and Possibilities. Thank you. So human longevity, myths and possibilities. And there's an awful lot of myths out there about how long we're going to live and why we are living longer and who's going to be uh, the first super centenarian or person who's going to make it to 200, uh, etc. Um, if that's possible. So let's start with um, this person. This, in fact, is the world's first super centenarian. Um, we don't know much about him. Um, he's called Gert Bungard, but we do know that he came from the Low Countries, what we now call the Netherlands, and we know that he fought as a foot soldier with Napoleon. And this is because he was actually born in 1788, and he died on the 3rd of February, 1899, aged 110 years and 135 days. Uh, and he very nearly made it into three centuries. He would have been the first person recorded uh, to have done that. And that was the record male life until 1966. And I think that's a really important message. There have always been long-lived individuals, but just not that many of them. So when Goethe was alive, there probably, in the whole of Europe, were 10 centenarians, 10 people who made it to 100. Um, we now have 14,000 centenarians alone in the UK. And as we will see as this uh, lecture continues, uh, the number of people reaching 100 is likely to increase quite dramatically uh, this century. So these are the two longest-lived people that we uh, have verifiable records. Jean Colmont of France is the longest-lived human being, as far as we know, 122. She died in uh, 1997. And the oldest verified male um, is um, uh, Kimura from Japan, and he died in 2013, aged 116. And what is really interesting about the two longest-lived people is that we actually have a lesson about longest-lived populations. Uh, French and Japanese and women live longer than men. And if you look at populations, you find exactly the same kind of message. So let's look at the kind of questions we're going to consider tonight uh, and then um, continue. So these, I think, are the four big questions that we still have a little bit of evidence around, uh, but they're the questions that are going to frame the 21st century. So number one, will increases in both life expectancy and in life extension or longevity continue? People sometimes confuse life expectancy and longevity. Longevity is around the longest lived individuals, and life expectancy is how long will the average age of death for the population be? Will life expectancy increase in line with longevity or life expectancy, or are we just going to have a few people living 122, 130, 140? Are we going to have whole populations continuing uh, to live long lives? Will um, life expectancy be accompanied by increases in life extension, or are we just sort of going to collapse? As populations live longer, are we still going to have that tale of longevity? And really importantly, will advances in life expectancy be matched by advances in healthy life expectancy? And I think that is the key. It isn't just life expectancy, it's what's going to happen with healthy life expectancy. So let's just, using these as a frame, uh, continue uh, through. Number one, let's look at increases in both life expectancy and life extension. We've talked a little bit about, obviously, longevity, because we looked at those two longest-lived people. But what about population life expectancy? This is um, period expectation of life at birth, and we've mapped here between 1841 and 2012, and you can see that for both men and women, it's been continuously upward for some time. Uh, interestingly, you can also see that the yellow line is female, the blue line is male, and women have always lived longer than men. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and in fact, that's true at all ages. So at all ages of life, mortality is higher for boys than it is for girls, for young men than it is for young women, uh, etc. So we've taken here a few countries. This is life expectancy at birth for some selected countries. 
we have, don't worry about too much about the um, uh, words, just look at the, the pictures. We have um, women at the top, they are the hard line, and we have men slightly lower down, they are the dotted line. And I don't know whether this will work. Yes, it will. Um, you can see at right at the top, so we have women, which are these, these are the hard lines, and men consistently below for all countries, these are the dotted lines. This is Japan, and this is France. As I said, exactly the same as the longest-lived people, reflected in the populations. Um, this is Australia, uh, this is um, New Zealand, and then we drop, that's the UK. So UK and New Zealand are actually very, very similar. Then there's quite a drop down to the USA, and the same order is more or less reflected uh, for men. So the really interesting thing, as I said, is why is it that Japan and France have such long lives as a population? So as an English woman, I can understand why Japanese women live so much longer than uh, UK women, but why do French women live so much longer than English women? We've only got the channel between us. Um, so I've just had a, a lovely sabbatical in Paris and spent quite a lot of time talking to the French demographers about this. And one of the things that they brought up is that the line isn't really the channel, it's actually across France. So northern French women have the same life expectancy as English women. And it's between the northern Europeans and the Mediterranean Europeans. And it probably is something to do with diet, the Mediterranean diet. And I'm going to come back to that uh, as we go on a little bit more. But why is it also that women consistently live longer than men? And I think one of the um, really interesting things uh, there is that we used to think that it probably was something to do with lifestyle. Uh, in other words, I remember once reading something about when women you know, start having the kind of stressful lives that men have, i.e. going out into the workplace, um, unlike it is at the moment where we tend to juggle both work and children, and that isn't really very stressful, um, then maybe our life expectancy will diminish. But one thing that we know is that there are certain biological differences, obviously, between men and women, but they seem to contribute to our life expectancy. And just very quickly, genetically, we're very different. Um, women, as you know, are XX, men are XY. Most of the information, as I keep telling my children, is carried on the X chromosome. In other words, they inherited all those good characteristics from me. Um, <laughs> However, if something goes wrong with that first X, you've got a second X, whereas men, being X, Y, don't. And interestingly, if you look at birds, the letters are different, but the equivalent is that birds are Y, Y, uh, male birds are Y, Y, and female birds are X, Y, and male birds typically live longer. So there's a genetic reason. There's also some very interesting research about the immune system, and we now know that women are much more able to fight off both viruses and bacteria more than men can, and that's sort of mixed news for women because it means actually man flu probably is correct. Um, <laughs> so when he's whinging away, maybe he does feel slightly sicker than we do. Um, but some other really interesting research is coming out around the hormonal system. Um, we've known for a long time that the female hormone estrogen protects, and we used to think that the male hormone testosterone didn't protect. We now have evidence which actually says that um, the male hormone, if anything, may increase mortality risk and morbidity risk. And there's a really interesting study, um, a historical study, looking at Korean records. And they can track these records from Korean courts back centuries. Uh, and what this has shown is that because there were the eunuchs, the castrated male Koreans, castrated male Koreans historically have lived 20 years longer than the uncastrated men. So there is a message for those men who want to raise their, um, <laughs> their life expectancy. So... <clears throat> the other thing we used to think, um, until very recently, literally till about the end of last century, was that life expectancy would continue to increase until you hit 65. And then from 65 onwards, mortality rates would be more or less flattened. <laughs> Um, again, look at the shape here. It's quite difficult with these lights, I think, probably to see some of these. But if, if you look at those shapes, that is the contribution of mortality, mortality decline in three age groups. So the green in the middle 
is um, people under uh, 29. The brown is people 30 to 64. And the blue is people over 65. And you can see in all these countries, with the exception of the one right at the bottom, which happens to be Macedonia, um, that it is the contribution is greatest among the over 65s. And so we've pushed death back so much that actually the increases in life expectancy we're now seeing typically are coming from the older adults, the over 65. And to give you an idea of how much life expectancy we can expect, it's roughly two and a half years per decade. In other words, that's 15 minutes an hour. So just by sitting here in this lecture, you will gain 15 minutes of life that you can then go and spend in the bar or whatever. So let's look at this. This is then life expectancy at age 65. How many extra years can you get when you hit 65? Uh, and actually, interestingly, the same kind of pattern, exactly the same kind of order uh, is shown. Uh, here, you can see a little bit more variability, but we're talking about an extra. Um, this is for women. We've got an extra roughly 23 years, um, up to 24 years at age 65 uh, for Japanese women. Um, New Zealand women are this, so they, you have about, that's about 21 years. Um, and exactly the same when we get up to 80. Um, you can see tremendous variability, and remember that, but same kind of order. Uh, and again, women at 80 living longer uh, than men, although obviously here you can see the gap uh, between the French and the new um, French and Japanese women uh, and the Australian women has quite significantly increased. So let's go on to look at um, this next question, which is around real. Uh, old age. This is a lovely couple. Um, they lived in Oxford, and this was taken in the local newspaper because it was their wedding anniversary. Um, and I, can't, I think it was their 70th wedding anniversary. And they were such a loving couple. And she died about two weeks after this picture was taken. But in my institute in Oxford, we have that picture. I think it's a very special picture. So how did we get here? Um, I talked about pushing death back across the life course, and I think this is a, a really good example. This is what we call the rectangulization of the life curve. And if you look here, um, this is 1851, that's the black age, and we've got the proportion surviving and the ages, and this is 2011. And you can see that in 1851, death across the life course, people died at all ages. Uh, whereas now, we've pushed back death. So much so that in 1851, half the European population was dead before they reached 45. Half the population uh, didn't make it to 45. Now, half the population in Europe is going to make it to well over 80. We've pushed death back. And if we look at this particular period, this is the period of the 20th century, um, we can really begin to understand what has happened to make life expectancy take off so much. These years, pushing back death, was very much around things like improving nutrition, public health, sanitation, clean water, but then the 20th century arrived. And what I've done here to demonstrate is this is UK male mortality between 1911 and 2005, and what we've put on this graph are the main killers. Um, and I don't know whether you can see the colors well, but basically, uh, the green um, here is respiratory, um, the blue is circulatory disease, um, the red is infections, and if you can see this yellow line, this is cancer. And if we just um, start here, uh, this is respiratory. Is that right? Yes, this is respiratory. <laughs> so what we have um, here is this massive peak uh, of deaths from respiratory diseases. Um, this is in, um, immediately after the First World War, and you can see how from then onwards we declined. So that by the time we get to the end of the 20th century, very few people are dying from things like uh, pneumonia, for example, or influenza. This obviously is the influenza peak uh, that occurred in the UK after the First World War. Um, this uh, red one, uh, this is um, infections, and again, huge number of infections. Uh, this was during the First World War, then it declined, Second World War, and now it's more or less flattened. And although there's a lot of fear around um, uh, anti-resistant um, 
bacteria because of anti, sorry, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, my friends at Oxford or my colleagues at Oxford who work with infectious diseases, they believe that we'll always be able to conquer infectious diseases, but it will be at a cost. We've had cheap antibiotics for, uh, since the Second World War, and now going forward, we probably will be able to conquer infections, but it's going to be much, much more expensive. Um, if we look at um, this, this is very interesting. This is um, circulatory, so cardiovascular disease and stroke. Remember, this is the UK. And here, in the 1980s, dramatic fall in deaths for men uh, from uh, stroke, cardiovascular disease. And does anyone know why that happened in the 1980s, what that was all about? Smoking. Exactly that. In the 1960s, in fact, out of Oxford, research had come which made that link between particularly stroke and cardiovascular disease. Uh, and there was a huge public health initiative. Men gave up smoking. And at the national level, you can see when these men hit their 50s and 60s, they basically stopped dying. This is cancer. This is the yellow. Uh, and that's much more flat across the 20th century. That's a very interesting story because Cancer, incidence of cancer has increased, but deaths from cancer has gone down. And I want to come back to that uh, later on. I just wanted to show you this, because let's go global on this. Um, this is taking female deaths across the life course. These are high-income countries, middle-income countries, and low-income countries. Um, and again, just uh, if we just start down here um, and look at some of these diseases, this, the red is communicable diseases, and you can see huge numbers across the life course, that's age in years along the bottom, are still dying at all ages from infectious uh, diseases. This is maternal, the green, but you can also see that there is a growth now in the chronic diseases, which is this uh, group here. Um, when we go into our middle-income countries, infectious diseases, which are red, and the green maternal diseases have been reduced, but this massive increase in things like cancer, cardiovascular disease, and then high-income countries like, obviously, uh, New Zealand. Um, you can see here we have practically no infectious diseases, uh, but we, this is cancer. The, that blue is cancer, cardiovascular disease is the light purple, and other non-communicable um, diseases. And this, interestingly, is in injuries. Um, and you can see, just because we've reduced death so much, that actually, um, particularly in, in this area. But let's look over here, because this really shows about pushing death back across the life course. You can see in our high-income countries, probably nobody dies in younger ages. All our deaths are in later ages, post-15, 60 in particular. Um, in our middle income, we have the babies still dying, but then, in actual fact, there's a reasonable pushback but this is the story we should be ashamed of, really. This is our low-income countries, particularly in Africa, and you can see the majority of deaths are concentrated, uh, particularly in births, but death across the life course. Women are dying at all ages. Um, but I think that gives a really good example when you look here at how that's why we're living longer. We're pushing death back because we're conquering the killers. What about going forward? What's going to happen going forward? Um, this is a, um, two very interesting studies that have come out around life expectancy. Um, I talked a little bit um, earlier about the fact that we never thought that we would reduce deaths after 65. The mortality risk would more or less uh, stay the same. We had the same thing about life expectancy. There was some theory that life expectancy at birth would never go above 90 degrees. And this has um, caused a lot of stir when it came out, and we can zoom it much bigger to have a look at these top countries. Um, this is a study uh, which um, was published in The Lancet using WHO material, doing probabilistic modeling. And you can see by 2030, this is South Korea, France and Japan, and interestingly, Spain. And we have life expectancies here of nearly and actually over 90. So the prediction is within 10 years, female life expectancy at birth will be over 90. Um, this is another study 
uh, which came out again, published in The Lancet. This is completely different modeling, completely different data, but a very similar story. And, and this is something that caused quite a stir when it was published. This is the oldest age at which at least 50% of a birth cohort is still alive. And this particular modeling the, is actually 2007. Right at the top, we have Japan, which is 107. So half the babies being born at the moment in Japan are likely to make it to 107. Um, we have here, this is um, UK and France, um, and then we drop down, um, the US is down here. This is the US, 102. Um, there's a, a, a little baby in the audience called Nico, who is one month old. His, life ex his real life expectancy is probably around about 102, 103. Quite extraordinary. My daughter, who was born in 1996, um, she probably, along with many of her friends, have a really good chance of living in three centuries. So girls who were born at the end of the 90s have a chance of living in three centuries, but girls and boys who've been born over the last 10 years, they also have that chance, because half of them probably will make it to a century. So centenarians has become something of great interest, um, and this is um, some modelling that was done um, by one of my colleagues, George Leeson, who's the director of the Institute uh, in Oxford. I said that there was 14,000 centenarians in the UK at the moment. Um, and when George did this modeling, we went, no, no, this is wrong, go away and redo your sums. Um, and he refused to because he was right, and the ONS, Office of National Statistics, and DWP, Department of Work and Pensions, within a couple of months have come up with the same projections for the UK. So this is 2010, round about uh, 14,000 uh, centenarians. Just look at the total, which is green. Um, this uh, modelling by George suggests that by the middle of the century, we'll have half a million centenarians in the UK, and by the end of the century, we'll have about 1.4 million in the UK. Eight million people living in the UK at the moment are likely to make it to a century. About 50 million Europeans are likely to make it to a century. Um, as a consequence, the world's centenarian population is likely to grow. Uh, this projection suggests that we will, by the middle of the century, have around about three and a half million centenarians on the planet. What is interesting, however, <clears throat> is that um, we are going to have... This is the number of centenarians, and inevitably a large number in China, just because of pure numbers. But Japan, the US, Italy, and even India are going to have large numbers of centenarians. Um, and if you look at the proportion, Japan uh, is right at the top. They will have roughly half a percent of their population is going to be centenarian. And Italy um, is going to be just below half a uh, percent of their population. So huge numbers of centenarians. I want actually just to pause just for a minute because I think it's important to reflect something that is also beginning to happen. And I don't know whether you read about it in the press here, but there's been quite a lot of interest in Europe because life expectancy suddenly seems to be flattening. Having all this stuff I've been telling you about, life expectancy is continuing. In fact, it seems to be flattening. And this is EU figures. Um, from 2015 onwards, you can see that for both men and women, life expectancy started to tip. Two really important um, papers have recently come out. Um, this was um, on England in the BMJ, and this one um, was in epidemiology on the States. And they've both come up with the same idea, that it is something to do possibly with the inequality in our population. So both the UK and the US have huge inequalities. Uh, and as a consequence, whereas the middle to high income groups are continuing to increase their life expectancy. We're seeing a stalling or even a fall in our low income, low educated groups. And that is so large, it's now impacting on our national life expectancy. So let's just look um, at the inequality question. Are we all going to benefit from increases in life expectancy or will it increasingly be just for a few? And I want to show you this study that we did in Oxford, um, and this shows huge inequality uh, in mortality uh, occurring in the UK. Um, this is a very large uh, pension data set, um, two million uh, pensioners. But the really important thing is it's occupational pension records. So we had access to two million occupational pension records, 500,000 of whom were dead, so we could really track back what were the forces behind their deaths. Occupational pensions is a very 
an already selected group of our population. We didn't have those people who were on zero hours contracts or part time um, or you know, unemployed. They've already been removed from this data set. So this is just those people who have salaried occupational pensions. And this is a comparison of UK life expectancies for men from age 65. And you can see here, um, we have our, whoopsie, wait a minute, I'm now going, that's it, we have our low income um, group here. So this is the low income, ill health retiree, unhealthy lifestyle group. They have 12 years uh, at uh, 65, whereas our high income group have 23 years. So that's 11 years difference between an already uh, subset. Um, and if you run that forward, um, you can see this is the proportion of 65-year-old men who are expected to survive to each age. Uh, at the top, we have the blue, they're the healthy, high-income group. At the bottom, we have the unhealthy, low-income group. And in a minute, you'll see that health and income in the UK are associated. Um, and by the time you get to um, your mid-80s, uh, there's a 50% chance of not surviving uh, if you're in the lower group compared with if you're in the upper group. That's the kind of impact. So what we were able to do was really tease out what were the factors that were driving this difference in longevity. Um, so at the top, we've got our manual employee, um, unhealthy lifestyle, ill health retiree. And if you remember, they had 12 years at age 65. If this man had done a non-manual job, he would have added in 0.7. If he'd retired in normal health, 1.8. If he'd had a high income, 4. But if he had had a healthy lifestyle, 4.6 years. And I think what we're increasingly beginning to realize is that actually, although income, etc., is important, it's actually whether or not you have a healthy lifestyle. And you've got to start, really, from when you are a child. How you're brought up as a child, what you eat, how you behave, we now know has a massive impact across your life and affects your life expectancy. But what is really important is the comparison between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. And that's something I raised at the beginning and I really want to focus on for the sort of second half uh, of this uh, lecture. And this is some work that um, I my group did for the um, UK government. We did a big review on the aging of the UK population. And this is using ONS data. So at this end, these are um, the bottom 10% living in the most deprived areas of England and Wales. Um, again, I'm just showing you men. And here, these are the people who are living in the top 10% um, uh, of the most affluent areas. So we have deprived areas, here, bottom 10%, most affluent here, um, uh, top 10%. And the green is healthy life expectancy, or sorry, the yellow it's come out, and that sort of turquoise is life expectancy. And what this shows very clearly is that if you are a man living in our most deprived areas, at 65, you can expect to live into and through your 70s, but your all of your 70s are likely to be in ill health. You'll only have five or six years of good health, and once you hit your 70s, you're going to be in poor health. If, however, you live in one of the most affluent areas, you're likely to live to your late 80s, and you won't even go into ill health until you hit your late 70s or 80s. So all of your 70s are going to be in good health. So we're beginning to realize the real difference in both healthy life expectancy and life expectancy uh, within the UK population based on income, education, uh, affluence, etc. So this is the really, really key question. Will advances in life expectancy be matched by advances in healthy life expectancy? And so let's just go back and look at some of these. Um, this is... Uh, what we've done here is we've done the same kind of idea, but we've compared life expectancy and healthy life years. And unfortunately, we couldn't get the healthy life expectancy data for Australia and New Zealand. It's very, very difficult to um, statistically do this, and um, so we don't have that reflected um, on these graphs. Um, but here at the top, we've got um, Spain, France, and um, Japan. Um, and at the bottom, 
This, this is the life expectancy, and at the bottom, we've got the healthy life expectancy. And this is for women at age 60. And you can immediately see the gap between, uh, so even if we take Japan, so at age 60, uh, their um, healthy years um, are going to be maybe 20, and then they're going to have about seven unhealthy years. And it's replicated in almost all countries. This is exactly the same for men, but you can see actually that the gap uh, between um, healthy life expectancy at the bottom and their longevity is even greater. So big gap uh, emerging. This is a very interesting um, slide because this shows life expectancy and healthy life years. And we've just taken uh, these three countries. Uh, we've got France, Spain, and the UK. And then this is the um, healthy life expectancy uh, at the bottom. And you can see quite interestingly that in actual fact, uh, it, British women, they stay um, healthier for slightly longer, interestingly enough, than the French and Spanish women. But there is, look at this massive gap. This, this is the gap of around about four or five years uh, of ill health that can be expected. And this is the same for men. Um, let's, yeah. What I really want to talk about is this, which is the impact of obesity. Um, if you remember, do you remember that graph when we were looking at changes in what was killing men and we looked at um, cardiovascular disease and stroke? And we talked about how just the public health initiative, stopping men smoking, had really reduced uh, their uh, deaths. So the big question is, what about obesity? Because if smoking was the big scourge of the 20th century, obesity is clearly a major uh, issue in the 21st century. And one of the things that uh, we were always um, discussing, but we didn't really have much data until recently, was this question. There was a, a feeling that actually obesity in the population, particularly among younger cohorts, was going to reduce life expectancy. Um, in Oxford, we had a different view, along with other colleagues, and we said, no, it won't reduce life expectancy, but it could well reduce healthy life expectancy. In other words, we believed that people would live as long, but they would spend more years in ill health. Um, but the impact of obesity was so concerning, and this is just a, a wonderful quote from a colleague of mine uh, from the University of Chicago, Jay Oshansky, who in 2005 stuck his neck out and basically said this. He said, we anticipate that as a result of the substantial rise in the prevalence of obesity and its life-shortening complications, such as diabetes, life expectancy at birth and old ages could level off or even decline in the first half of the century. So there was this big debate uh, about uh, 10 years ago. We now have some really good evidence about this, and I just want to show you uh, this. And I'm going to illustrate it with this study. This is a Dutch study, um, and it was published in um, Public Health in 2011, but I think it's a really nice uh, study. What they did was they took um, a very large sample of men and women aged 55, and they looked at obesity, smoking, and alcohol on reducing life expectancy or increasing disabled years. And what you can see very clearly from that graph is that whereas alcohol and smoking reduces life expectancy in this particular sample by between three to four years, it increases disabled years between three or four years. Obesity only reduced life expectancy by 1.4 years, but it increased disabled years by nearly six. So I think we began in 2011 to have some real evidence that actually obesity is reducing healthy life expectancy, but actually people are still continuing to live. And I just want to show you, this is a, um, a sample that came, a study that came out last year, um, and this was looking at the reduction in healthy years out of the US, um, and it's a very, very large um, survey. Uh, and the really interesting thing uh, that it showed, um, and we can show you by doing this. Okay, <clears throat> this, they took um, these um, four uh, national studies, um, and they compared life expectancy with healthy life expectancy. Um, and if we just take ELSA, ELSA is the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. Um, if you had a normal weight, 
your life expectancy um, in this particular study was、uh, roughly 23 years. If you were obese class two, your life expectancy was 23 years. So you've gone from 23.83 years to 23.17 years. But let's look at healthy life expectancy. If you're a normal weight in England, then you have a, a life expectancy in this particular study of 19 years. But your healthy life expectancy, so your healthy life expectancy is、uh, 19 years. But your、um, healthy life expectancy, if you are obese class two, is only 13 years. So you can see we've got nearly 24 years of life expectancy, 19 of which will be in health. Compared with 23 years of life expectancy, of which、uh, only 13 will be in health, and I'm not going to go into detail, but you can actually whiz this through. This is exactly the same findings from this Finnish study, and if we go on to, I've just showed you women here, exactly the same.、Uh, we've got normal weight life expectancy 25 and 20 in this particular study, and if you're obese, 24 years of life expectancy and only 13 of healthy life expectancy. So I think we now have some really firm evidence coming out that obesity is actually affecting healthy life expectancy, not life expectancy itself. That's the obesity story, which is not good news for public health. The dementia story is actually much, much better news.、Um, you need to you need to focus on、um, this green line, okay? So this is a、um, multi-study, but the green line was done out of Cambridge、uh, by、um, a group led by、um, Carol Brain, and what he was looking at was the changes in age-specific incidence and age-specific prevalence of dementia in the population, and they found that in the UK we now have a reduction in cohorts coming into later life in both age-specific incidence. And the prevalence within the population, and that was so striking that they began to try and think what could be causing this. It probably is something to do with drugs, the drug therapy people are on. It's possibly something to do with increasing exercise in that population, better diet, etc. But probably the most likely is to do with education. Because we know we've got better educated cohorts coming through, and there's a very interesting relationship between education and dementia, because we know that better educated people have fewer symptoms of dementia than those with lower education. Now, whether or not it is that better educated people are able to hide the symptoms of dementia for longer, or whether it's something to do with education actually stimulating the brain so that you don't get dementia. That's unclear, but we know there is an association. And then we had this fantastic study that came out the following year. This came out in 2016. This was published in JAMA, a very, very large American study, and it showed exactly the same. And these figures are quite extraordinary. 21,000 U.S. adults were in this study, aged over 65, and the dementia prevalence declined significantly from 11.6% in 2000. Down to 8.8 percent in 2012, and what they were able to do, basically by coincidence, they just hit the cohort in the states which had one extra year of education. So they just happened to hit that school year where you had this extra year, and it seems to have made a significant impact on dementia. So the dementia story is good because through drug therapy. And through things like exercise, and as I say, we now know that particularly exercise and diet doesn't just do your、um, cardiovascular system good; it also does your brain good. But probably education is going to play a really big role going forward. So the dementia story is good. Will increases in life expectancy be accompanied by increases in life extension, or are we going to see a compression of longevity? And that's the really big story as well.、Um, as we get populations living longer. Are we going to find more and more people reaching 100, but then actually dying, or are we going to see these supercentenarians increasing? And this is a really interesting study that comes out of France.、Um, this is the change in distribution of ages at death for women, comparing the 1950、uh, group with the 2000 uh, to 2004 group.、Um, we now have enough evidence, particularly from Japan, where we have these very long-lived people, to be able to say something about this. Just look at this. So, in this particular study, 
This is the 1980 group. And you can see this is like the peak of death and then the tail. And we compare it with the 2000 study and again the peak of death and the tail. And you can see that both the peak and the tail are moving out. And I think we've now replicated this also in France. And therefore, there is evidence that actually, as we get more centenarians, so we're going to get more super centenarians, so we're going to get more super, super centenarians. We are pushing the life expectancy of the population at old ages further and further. What has been really interesting is that everything we have seen to date has been driven by these two top determinants. That's basically healthy living and disease prevention and cure. Uh, we know enough to be able to say how we got here. So, for example, we know th simple things like impact of daily fruit and vegetables on preventing illnesses. Um, and this is a study which looked at these are two and a half portions uh, of fruit and vegetables compared with the light grey, which are 10 portions of fruit and vegetables. And you can see dramatic uh, increases in preventing illness just by increasing uh, the proportion of fruit and vegetables in your diet. Simple things like that. Um, this is uh, simply um, showing male mortality deaths and across time uh, and how we have been able to um, reduce uh, those simple, um, going forward, those simple diseases. So just uh, keeping people alive with chronic diseases for longer has also pushed back uh, life expectancy. But what about these two, regenerative medicine and age retardation? We now have people who are doing serious science on trying to understand how we really can extend lives. And I'm just going to give you a very quickly uh, a couple uh, of examples. Um, when you go into the world of biotechnology, uh, 3D printing, we can now print hearts. Uh, so people are talking about going forward, we're going to be able to print bits of the body uh, and reinsert them. Nanotechnology stem cell research, etc. the new genetics. Um, simple things like dietary restriction. There's a lot of work that's going on in animals, uh, and if we reduce our calories, we extend our lives. And biologically, we really understand enough now to be able to say how that mechanism works. We understand about how it works in small mammals, and the scientists now believe that they understand how they could really uh, start extending human lives. You have to live on about 500 calories a day, so your life's pretty miserable, um, a bit like the Korean story, um, but at least you are extending your lives. At the other end, we have far more complicated science, and this is a major breakthrough. This is some work that's being done at Oxford by some colleagues of mine, and this is on stem cell research real problems with embryonic stem cells. This is adult stem cells. And what they're doing here is taking a skin cell from a human, you turn it into a stem cell, and then you reprogram it so it's a therapeutic stem cell. And we know already that in the clinic, we've been able to grow muscles in the eye, muscles in the heart, and muscles in the leg. And one of the things we're discussing with our colleagues who work on this is how will life expectancy be affected if we have massive stem cell uh, research possibilities in the whole population. But there's a problem, because we know that stem cells also are linked into cancer. And the big question that we're now discussing is, if we're going to have things like stem cell therapy over the next two or three decades widely available in the older population in order to regrow bits of the body, a certain percentage, but we don't know how large, will develop cancer. Maybe that's acceptable to our society, that we just get used to the fact that when you get into old age, you live with cancer. Maybe it isn't. So science is now driving us into all sorts of sort of ethical questions uh, in this area. We also know that there are some people who just simply age slower than other people. Um, we know quite a lot about the supercentenarian now, and those people who live over 105, particularly between 105 and 110, they age very differently from the rest of us. They typically are very, very healthy, very low uh, incidences of cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and then typically they will become ill and frail and actually die quite quickly, just in a few months at the end of their lives. But we now know enough to be able to say these people are slightly probably genetically different uh, from us. So, just to conclude, 
What about those broader implications? And I think there are several implications. This, I think, um, this is a wonderful um, painting, um, the old man and his grandson. What about um, generational succession? Um, we live in societies where we've always had regular generation succession. Um, we're used to inheriting assets and wealth and status uh, from our parents in a regular way. What happens when we don't inherit uh, from our parents uh, until we're in our 80s? Or what happens when we don't inherit from our grandparents until we're in our 80s? What happens to the world of work when we're all in work, probably in our 60s, 70s and 80s? What happens to younger generations? And I think that generational succession is going to be a really pressing concern going forward. What about the generational contract? Uh, we have, in most societies, this idea that when you're an adult parent, you care for a child. When that child grows up, they care for you. It's called the generational contract. Many people are now arguing that, particularly with current cohorts of older people who have benefited from reductions in fertility, in so much as many of our current older generation had far fewer children, so they didn't have many child dependents, and from reductions in mortality, because thankfully, we're all living longer and healthier. Should that generational contract continue, or should older adults have more responsibility for looking after themselves? And that's a really big discussion at the moment. And then finally, this one. This is at Blackfriars, Blackfriars Station in London. It's based um, on Shakespeare, Seven Ages of Man, when we have 100 or 150 years of life, will we still have seven ages? Will we have 12 ages? Or will we actually have a far more fluid life course? Um, in the UK at the moment, we say to people, stay in education till you're 25. You can retire at 55, and oh, you're probably going to live to 100. So 25 to 30 years of activity and productivity in the middle of 100 years. And we're now talking about mixing work and leisure and care People with young children, maybe not working flat out in the workplace, but having a sort of sabbatical for 10, 15 years to bring up their children, and then coming back in their 40s or 50s into the workplace and working for another 30 years, spreading probably the same amount of work across a life course. So that's just an idea of human longevity and life expectancy. That's just a brief teaser about some of the implications we often don't think about because we tend to think about healthcare and pensions, but really big societal shifts are going to happen when we have the kind of demography that we're seeing. In 10 years' time, half the population of Western Europe will be aged over 50. We've never had a region of the world where half our population is aged between 50 and 100. Run that forward to the middle of the century, and we could well find that half the European population is over 60, with half of the children being born living to over 100. Those kind of big changes going forward. This is um, the Institute at Oxford, and this is just a picture of Oxford to remind you. Thank you. <laughs>